Okay, hi there, and uh, welcome to a, a video on some of the key macroeconomic diagrams that can be used as part of your A-level economics, in particular your paper two. Had a request from uh, quite a few students just to say uh, that they know there's loads of diagrams for micro, but uh, what are the key diagrams that would be useful in macroeconomics? So let's work through some examples together in this video, and I've provided a download link uh, in the notes section of this video so that you can download a PDF version which has all of these charts and diagrams in one place for you. Uh, a, few, a few key words of advice before we, we race through some diagrams. First of all, the days of the memorized diagram are probably gone now, especially at the new A-levels. You really do need to think about what you're drawing in the context of the question. Diagrams actually score fa fairly few marks unless they're used to contribute to your analysis. They could also, of course, help with the evaluation, but fundamentally, the analysis. So you need to understand the diagrams, what the lines are, the areas, that the equilibrium points, and then apply them dynamically to the context provided. Please don't just draw diagrams willy-nilly. Really try to think, well, what am I using this diagram for? And develop your diagrams. Lines on diagrams need to be shifted in response to the scenario that you're given. It could be the effect of a demand-side policy or an external shock or a supply-side policy. There could be a new area to share, a new equilibrium national income to, to highlight, a new change in inflation to show. So really try to develop your diagrams as best you can. I can't show all the examples of developed diagrams. Hopefully this video will give you a flavour of the ones that will, will be really useful. And keep in mind, a good diagram can often get you to a level three analysis pretty quickly. And uh, you can do that in a, in, a matter of, in a matter of minutes. So here we go, here's a few diagrams to, to think about. You'll certainly need to go back to your aggregate demand and aggregate supply framework. Uh, it depends on whether you've gone for a Keynesian approach or a neoclassical model. Don't think it really matters as long as you stick and you're consistent with what you're using, as long as it's clear. So here's a Keynesian aggregate supply curve where the elasticity of supply, of course, changes at different levels of spare capacity in the economy. Elastic at levels of output Y1, Y2, uh, inelastic at levels of output Y3, Y4. Uh, the, the multiplier effect, of course, so you can use aggregate demand and supply analysis to explain, to help explain the size of the, of the multiplier effect. You could actually use a Keynesian curve. The multiplier effect is smaller when aggregate supply is inelastic. But here I've just drawn linear aggregate supply curves. On the left-hand side, aggregate supply is highly elastic, lots of spare capacity in the economy, high, high unemployment, for example. The multiplier effect is likely to be high following an increase in aggregate demand, whereas on the right-hand side, aggregate supply is inelastic. Um, it's harder to aggregate supply to expand to meet an increase in demand following a stimulus. Uh, you can even use your PPF analysis, absolutely fine to use it as part of your macroeconomics, particularly when you're thinking about the growth of an economy and the likely effectiveness and impact of supply side policies. So don't be afraid to use PPF diagrams. Again, draw to the axes, shift the curves out, uh, contextualise the, the, the X and the Y axis. Are, is there a particular industry that we're looking at? This is consumer goods and capital goods. Um, but make it clear that this is an increase in the country's productive capacity. You can use aggregate demand or supply analysis to show growth as well. Here's a, a neoclassical diagram showing an outward shift in aggregate demand and also an outward shift in aggregate supply. If the aggregate supply curve shifts out, the productive potential of a country has increased and um, there could have been a fall in unit costs as well, perhaps a fall in in unit labour costs, shifting aggregate supply in the short term to the right as well. Build your analysis. Oftentimes we find in the exam students draw perfunctory, a bit superficial, kind of half-hearted diagrams. Well, they'll get, the, they'll get the low analysis marks. If you go for it, you'll get the top marks. And will deserve to as well. The upper gap, of course, crucial macroeconomic concept. It's, it's not something that can be measured very accurately but it's a concept that there's a difference between potential GDP and where the economy actually is in the economic cycle. This diagram here is a, showing the output gap uh, at Y1 is a negative output gap because level of GDP Y1 is less than potential YP. 
However, at a much higher level of aggregate demand AD2, the upper gap is positive because the level of GDP there, Y2, is, is above potential. And of course, that's likely to be unsustainable going forward. You might explain how the economy would adjust back towards potential output. But again, you'd be using these diagrams to show the output gap. Uh, here's an output gap Keynesian model. So typically when the economy is uh, um, well below full employment, then the output gap is negative. As you get closer to YFE full employment, the aggregate supply curve becomes inelastic and the output gap becomes positive. Using the Keynesian model to show economic growth, here we see an increase in aggregate demand, outward shift in AD, uh, perhaps caused by a demand side stimulus or an increase in exports, uh, matched by an increase in productive potential, perhaps an increase in productivity or the capital stocks grown, increasing efficiency or innovation uh, on the supply side. And again, you're shifting the curve to, to tell a story, to build a narrative, a narrative about what might have happened to the economy. Uh, you can use ADAS analysis if you get a question on uh, the stages of the economic cycle. Keep in mind that paper two, your macro paper, is your macro from last year, year 12, and your macroeconomics from this year, year 13. So you'll be using aggregate demand and supply. In this case, I'm showing the effect of, a, of an inward shift in demand, um, perhaps caused by a fall in exports or a loss of confidence, taking the level of output down from Y1 to Y2. Uh, there's a moot point about whether arrows are useful. I don't have a particularly strong view. I think sometimes arrows can be helpful to show the direction of change. But providing you're labelling each diagram numerically, it should be should be pretty obvious, don't you think? Cost push inflation, again, ADAS, you'll be using it to show, well, demand pull inflation, but also cost push inflation. Here we see an inward shift of aggregate supply caused, for example, by an increase in the price of imported raw materials and components. Uh, one really strong tip for you that if you get a question on exchange rates, depreciation, or in this case, an appreciation, an increase in the external value of the exchange rate, please do use aggregate demand and aggregate supply analysis to help build your analysis. A lot of students don't really use this. Currency appreciation, for example, makes exports more expensive and in theory will cause an inward shift of demand. 81 to 82. But it also, of course, increases the, the, the external value of the currency, means that you can buy imports more cheaply. So your oil and gas and copper and rubber and zinc could be uh, less expensive. Aggregate supply as a result shifts out to the right. And it's just this idea that you can just build a slightly more complex and detailed explanation that, that lifts the answers into the B, the A, the A star range. Phillips curve model again. It depends on what kind of Phillips curve model you've been you've been uh, taught. Um, it doesn't matter as long as you apply the ideas. This, of course, is the idea that there might be there might be a trade-off between the rate of unemployment and the rate of wage and price inflation. Uh, when unemployment is very high, uh, typically uh, the the trade-off is favourable. The economy has plenty of spare capacity, and we can get unemployment down without without any serious risk of inflation. On the right-hand side, the Phillips curve becoming more inelastic and the trade-off is worsening. It's becoming more of a, a conflict between unemployment and inflation. Some people are taught the long-run Phillips curve concept or the natural rate unemployment, unemployment idea, uh, where the Phillips curve is essentially vertical at a given natural rate. Uh, on the right-hand side here, I'm showing a fall in the natural rate and actually a downward shift in the Phillips curve, such that unemployment could fall to a lower level without there being a rise in inflation. Should say at this point that for each of these diagrams, there is a there's a topic video and there's a lot of great resources out there. But we have got some topic videos on each of these, some updated videos on the Phillips curve, for example. And I'll throw some links down into the into the video notes a bit later on. Um, moving now on to trade on our quick fire journey through the macro diagrams. Many of you will have those kind of horrendous matrix tables of two countries and two products producing tea and coffee or whatever it is. You can, of course, use a PPF to show some of the potential gains from specialization and trade. The key is to go into the exam with a diagram that works, that you know works. You don't have to waste time on it. In this case, Australia and Malawi. Malawi is relatively better at tobacco. Uh, 
Australia relatively better at beef. The difference in ingredients tells you there's a difference in comparative relative opportunity cost. Australia should specialise in beef, Malawi in tobacco. Actually, if they traded one to one, you could then develop this diagram to show both countries benefiting. Uh, one of the big areas of macroeconomics where you will be using extra diagrams, supply and demand analysis essentially, but good diagrams, of course, is in the area of trade, globalization and protectionism. So here's a trade liberalization diagram where the tariff goes down. Initial tariff on vehicles is reduced, perhaps as part of a trade agreement, and that uh, it causes changes in consumer and producer welfare. This diagram can be used, for example, to show some of the benefits of trade liberalization in terms of trade creation. You will definitely, probably, <laughs> be using tariff diagrams in your economics. Highly topical issues, so make sure your tariff diagrams are, are practiced and well understood. And then just apply them to the context. Here's a tariff on steel. Um, draw to the axes if you want to really go to town in terms of showing the welfare consequences. Here's a tariff showing an increase in the price of steel. Develop it further. And if you really want to go for this, show the, the areas of consumer surplus and the deadweight loss of, of economic welfare. I said in my previous video on diagrams, it's probably, probably better to label rather than shade. So when you're practicing your diagrams, if you're showing consumer and producer surplus, etc., tax revenues, practice labeling quickly and accurately so that you're into the, the exam diagram uh, zone, if you like. Uh, another area you can use diagrams in macro is if you get a question on currency economics. Lots of questions ask you to analyze or explain causes of movements in currencies, either in appreciation or depreciation. Perfectly legitimate to use currency market analysis. In this case, I'm showing the possible effects of an increase in interest rates, attracting hot money into a currency, shifting out the demand curve and driving the external value up. I'm more interested here in the value on the y-axis. I could have and perhaps should have drawn to the x-axis. Silly me. Uh, you know, J-curve diagrams, pretty pretty much 10 a penny these days. This is the one I prefer, that a depreciation of the exchange rate may initially cause the trade balance to worsen because of the low elasticities of demand and supply for uh, what well, demand for exports and imports. Uh, initially, the trade balance may worsen, but hopefully if the martial learner condition is met, the trade balance may improve. But please don't necessarily take that curve into surplus territory. Depreciation on its own is unlikely to, to cause a structural trade deficit to disappear. The Kuznets curve is, is used well by some students, particularly those students who like to talk about economic growth and development and the possible impact on inequality. On the y-axis, you have a measure of inequality, so-called Gini coefficient. You could use something else. And on the right-hand side, the x-axis per capita national income, adjusted for PPP. And the Kuznets curve suggests that actually often inequality goes up as countries are industrializing and urbanizing. But there may come a point, an inflection point, where with progressive taxes and slightly more generous welfare systems, perhaps more balanced income growth across households, the emergence of a middle class of consumers, inequality may, may fall over time. It doesn't have to. So you can develop this diagram. You don't have to draw that Kuznets curve. You can have a range of outcomes in your diagram. Uh, again, if you get a question on inequality and changes in inequality of income and wealth, then the, the, the Lorentz curve, and the associated Gini coefficient is a really good diagram to draw. In this case, uh, showing two Lorentz curves, one for a country with relatively low inequality, a country like Finland, perhaps, or Slovenia, and a country with much higher, the green curve there, much higher inequality, perhaps a country like South Africa or Chile, for example. These diagrams can always be practiced. I cannot tell you how important good diagrams are when well applied and well developed. They make a massive difference to your papers. And I think some of you are going to do some tremendous work in the exams. Crowding out is also a good area for macro diagrams. Crowding out theory is the idea that if governments borrow more, spend more, they have to go to the bond market and uh, they're essentially taking 
uh, an increased claim on the supply of loanable funds, of savings. So that can drive up the real interest rate on government debt, so-called yield on debt, which could then possibly crowd out private sector investment. So crowding out is fine. You can change the elasticities if you want to, to mess about with that kind of stuff. Uh, another thought is to use a, a bond market diagram if you get a question on quantitative easing. So in this situation, uh, oh, that's a, that's a poor diagram, is that? I'm just going to change it. Here we go. I'm going to change it on the hoof. Here we go. In this situation, the Bank of England, that's better. Bank of England goes into the market and uh, buys bonds. This is diagrams on the hoof, have really live diagrams. Bank of England goes and buys bonds in the market, shifting out the demand for bonds, driving up the price of bonds because there's a greater demand. Um, Bank of England buying bonds, for example, from commercial banks. The price of bonds goes up, then the yield on a bond goes down. Nothing wrong with using a bond market supply and demand diagram if you get a macro question on quantitative easing. Very few students will do that. I've got a feeling that some of you will. Hey, this is the last slide. It's the old Laffer curve. It's our favourite. I, I would avoid drawing a Laffer curve which goes from hero to zero. That kind of, you know, smiley facey. N-shaped bell curve, Laffer curve. I think a slightly more nuanced curve is better. That uh, there could be, there could be a tax rate in this case T3, which optimizes the total revenue from taxation. There could be. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it's, you know, but but it could be the case that if you raise taxes above T3, then the tax revenues going to the government could shrink. Equally, if you increase tax rates from T1 to T2. You can lift the total tax revenues. For many developing countries, actually, the tax revenue is too low. Tax rates are too low relative to uh, the size of their economy. And what you really want is a slightly higher tax rate, perhaps increasing the tax burden on corporations to lift the tax revenue coming into in your economy. So that's I think this is a more slightly nuanced Laffer curve rather than the kind of lazy diagram that students often draw. Well, hopefully this has been useful. We've been through a, a range, I don't know, 23, 24 diagrams here, just to give you a flavour of the types of diagrams you can use in your macroeconomics. If you heard my squeaky chair, apologies for that. I need to go get some WD-40. You, you people, you good people need to get on with some revision. So I'll pause there and say thank you.